Hello, this is a recording about the Let's Play assessment tool, um, which we use quite a lot in the early development and inclusion team. Um, it was developed by Judy Waters, an educational psychologist in the late 90s, and it focuses on using toys that a child would be familiar with um, from perhaps from their own home or from their preschool setting or their nursery um, and done in a very play-based manner to aim to see the child's um, development in, a, in the most natural way that you possibly can. Um, so you will see that the um, areas that you're going to look at are listed out on the Let's Play document in a particular order, starting with symbolic play with large toys. Um, there is a suggestion on the notes, which, which I'll make sure you have as well, um, that you can start with whatever area you think is going to be easiest for the child to engage with. So if their favourite thing is looking at a book, one of the areas is looking at a book, you could start with that. Um, but I'll run through them in the order that they're given on the sheet. And I'm just going to just show you very briefly the toys that I use so that you can see, although they're list listed out really, really clearly. Um, and also just give you a little um, idea of the, the level of prompting that I use. So running through it according to the order on the sheet, um, the first activity is symbolic play with large, large toys. Um, so this is an example of, of ones that I would use. Um, so I have my couple of cuddly toys. Um, I have a, a bed with a cover. Um, I have, um, well it could either be a teapot or a kettle and I've tried to keep it a bit um, open-ended. I'm just wondering how many children actually see teapots in their everyday life at the moment. So I've tried to keep it as one that could maybe just be a kettle. Um, and there's a cup that goes with that and then a little um, bag with a toothbrush and a flannel inside um, and what I'm looking for is how the child will use these toys um, I'm looking for whether they will relate the, the toys to themselves so by brushing their own teeth perhaps, or washing their own face with the flannel, or giving themselves a drink with a cup. Whether they'll do that to the, the one or both of the cuddly toys, and whether they will um, use the toys in any kind of a sequence. So it might be that the child might give dog a drink, um, might having first perhaps poured the drink out of the kettle, and then they might brush the dog's face, wash his face and put him to bed under the cover. That would be a really big long sequence. Um, whether they do any of that linking, um, so maybe first wash face, second brush teeth, third put him to bed. Um, I'm looking at whether they do any of that spontaneously. So when I first got out the toys, I wouldn't direct the child. I might just say something like, what can we do with these? And watch to see um, what they what they decide to do. Um, I'd spend a bit of time observing that and I'd use that time to kind of note on my sheet um, or the person noting it for me would note down certain things that they're seeing. So um, I would um, hope that they might name dog and they might name pig. That's the very first one. Um, you know, and I, I might prompt them to do that because it, it notes that, you, that the child is doing that with encouragement. So who's this? And see if they name um, dog. Um, I would note um, whether they apply the toy to themselves, whether they relate um, toys to one another, for example, giving the dog a drink. And I would kind of work my way down that list and, and see what I'm actually observing. Um, it moves on then to um, miniature play. 
The items that you use for your miniature play um, don't have to be a doll's house if that really isn't something that the child that you're working with is interested in. But just make sure that you've got enough equipment so that you can see um, their play and what they're doing with the items quite clearly. Um, so with this set, it's, it's easy to see whether a child um, is just randomly moving things around, putting things inside other things, piling them up. Um, or whether they're actually relating the toys to their purpose and whether they're relating their, the toys to one another. So are they doing things like putting somebody in the bath and pretending to make the sound of the water going in? Are they um, performing a little bit of a, a sequence um, where perhaps somebody um, gets out of bed and goes to sit and watch television? Or is it just single actions like put somebody in the bed? Um, are there any longer sequences like somebody's watching television and then they're going over to make their dinner? Um, so it's just having a look at what the child's doing within their play um, and then you joining in and seeing whether they'll accept you taking their play a little bit further and you can note whether you've done something um, supporting their play or whether they've done it completely independently. So this is the um, brick building section of the assessment um, which is quite a meaty um, section of it actually and, and quite a bit more directional um, than some of the others. Um, so I'll just show you how I would do it. So I would have a selection of bricks myself and give hopefully exactly the same types and colours to the child that I was working with. So you need a selection of at least 10 bricks of different colours and then you work your way through um, the assessment. Um, I have to admit that I don't have three sizes of bricks and I don't have bricks with letters and numerals on them. So I slightly pick and choose which ones I'm doing out of this section and then try and cover some of the other elements in different, different sections. Um, so the elements that I tend to pick out is I'm noting whether the child is picking up the bricks with a pincer grip or a palmer grasp. Um, I am noticing whether they, um, how they would naturally play with the bricks before I've started to play with mine. So whether they're naturally already starting to, to build them into towers. Um, and then when I start playing, whether they're able to copy me. So if I build a tower of two or three, whether they can copy me. Um, later on, you're looking at whether they can copy the sequence that you've done. So that if you've done red, purple, yellow, can they do um, a tower that's the same as that? Um, and can they name the colours? Um, looking at whether they can build bigger towers, and I think that's where the, the larger and smaller bricks come in. Um, so you might prompt them to use the bigger bricks at the bottom of the tower so that they can manage to build a tower of seven plus, which isn't an easy thing to do, let's face it. Um, a particularly interesting one is whether they can copy um, building a bridge um, so whether you can show them that and whether they'll copy that. Um, counting out bricks, um, so can they count out a number of bricks for you? Can they count out two? Can they count out four bricks um, in response to you requesting that? Um, can they name a range of colours? Um, can they build um, a set of steps? There's one suggestion much later on. Um, can they build a pyramid using 10 bricks? Um, and um, can they count three bricks using one-to-one -one correspondence? Um, can they count out a, bricks, a number of bricks in a set of four? 
So you're sort of working your way down the assessment and noting what the, what they can do, but try and very much keep it in a play context and you using your bricks and prompting them to copy you. This is the six piece form board section. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a six piece form board shape inset puzzle. Um, so I've improvised with something that you may have in your setting, um, which is the dotty dinosaur game. So this is where the, the dinosaurs have the shapes on one side and dots on the other. So I, I, the way that I use this is first of all, I present the child just with one shape and see if they can match um, it just onto to the one section. And then in line with the, the instructions on your sheet, I use three shapes. I tend to use those three and see if they can match those three. And then I'll use all of them, all six. Um, but then I'll also use a form board just to see if they can insert shapes into a jigsaw form board. Um, and I, I actually combine it with the, the lotto section, so I don't, I don't do both. Um, because in the picture lotto um, section later on, you're looking at whether a child can point to name to pictures and name them. So I'll just say, you know, can you point to cow? Can you point to pig? Um, and see if the child can point out the picture. Can the child name four of them? Can they name all of them? Um, and can they match to the pictures? So I'll then take the, the pieces out and see if the child can, can match the correct pictures um, and can they, do they understand that they're they're matching cow to cow rather than cow to the, the sheep picture or, or whatever. So I tend to combine those two. If you happen to have uh, um, an inset puzzle with six shapes on, then that's perfect. But that's how I get round um, the fact that unfortunately I don't. The next section is the shape sorter. Um, they're notice, noting at least three shapes. Mine has, mine has got four um, holes for shapes, but I make sure that I, um, I have a sphere to put in. So actually the, the round hole is, is for a cylinder in this shape sorter, but the first thing that I present to the child is a ball to see if they can post that um, in the circular shape um, because that's one of the criteria that you're looking at and then I present all the shapes and just note um, the, whether they have a really clear approach to they can see straight away that the triangle goes into the triangle hole and so on and that's what you're intended to look at in that section and you ask them a question about colours as well. Uh, lacing and sorting shapes. Um, all I would say about this is I just try and make them quite chunky um, shapes to thread. Um, so these ones um, that I use are, are the fruit ones with a, a really big chunky um, sort of needle as it were and the child then can then select from the fruit so, you, so they're playing and then you might prompt them to select an apple or a banana um, so selecting some shapes on request is one of the criteria. And then you might ask them to, you might tip the shapes off and then ask them to just put on the blue ones or just put on the yellow ones. Um, so that's, that's all I would need to say about that. Uh, we're on to 15 ball abacus. Um, I'm sure that there are uh, different things within the Let's Play assessment that you think, I haven't got that. Um, as you've seen me do already, you have to kind of improvise a certain amount and pick and choose the ones that, that you do have equipment for. Um, but this is what I use um, for this one. And I use the numbers on this um, to counterbalance the fact that I haven't got numbers on my bricks earlier on. Um, so what you're doing with this one is I would um, put some of the circles onto the posts as a demonstration and ask the child to carry on and see if they can fill it up. Um, I would note whether they're matching colours at all. 
I would ask them to give me, so if I had my four orange um, circles, I would ask them to give me um, two of them. I would ask them to name the colours. I would um, take them off again and make a sequence. Um, I probably wouldn't do it on here actually because the colours are determined on my pegs. So I would just try doing a, a little sequence and see if they can copy it similar to what we did with the bricks. Um, and I would see whether they could um, just, given the, the five, I would see if they could just put three um, of the, the circles on or just put four of the circles on um, or whether they could count out five of the circles for me. Um, so it's sort of working your way through that activity. So we're coming to the end of the assessment. Um, there's a few sections which are really um, just, just obvious, um, what you would use and how you would do them. Um, the nesting beakers, uh, using a lift the flat book to work the way, way your way through the assessment for that and the ball section I would always just do outside as part of your play and note what you're seeing. Seeing, And then the, the very last one is crayon, paper, scissors. Um, I tend to use a whiteboard um, for the drawing element of this and then obviously you've got your scissors and paper as well. Um, so you're noting obviously what the child's doing um, with the, the crayons or the pen in this instance, whether they're using a preferred hand or swapping them over, uh, whether they're just doing a, a circular scribble, um, whether they're drawing kind of um, vertical or horizontal lines, um, whether they can copy a circle, copy a cross, um, whether if you give them a circle and you say this is somebody's face, can they put the eyes on, can they put the mouth on, can they draw a V in imitation of you, um, can they add several features to a face drawing, so can they add some hair, can they add ears, um, seeing whether they can draw um, a recognisable picture of a person whether they can do a zigzag. Um, so you're working your way through these various things. And then you're having a look at their scissor skills. Um, if you're holding the paper, can they do snips around the edge? Um, can they cut along a line? And can they cut out a circle? So it's quite a long assessment, um, that one at the end with the, um, the crayons, paper and scissors I think is one to do on its own probably because that's again quite a meaty one and it's a, a question of picking your time and doing little sections if that works better for you and kind of an as assembling a, a picture of the whole assessment over probably a few days. Um, so. I hope that you find it helpful to use Let's Play and I hope that's helped you to kind of see what sort of equipment to use and the, um, the lists of criteria that you're looking at and the notes about it are something that I can email along to you.